Uh, we are going to be taking a quick concession or a quick break from the routine of normal, the normalcy of book by book on uh, Wednesday nights or chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And I'm going to be preaching a topical sermon for this week, possibly next week. It just depends. I'm trying to figure out which book that I want to pick right now. So I have a topical sermon that I, I've really been wanting to preach, and it kind of went in a different direction. Uh, but I'm going to be preaching through uh, specific verses that I believe are extremely misunderstood. The title of the sermon this evening is The Witness of Men and the Witness of God. Now I'm going to be preaching through some specific verses in 1 John chapter number 5 that I believe is almost all the time misunderstood. They're constantly misunderstood, and the reason being is because it's a result of the misunderstanding of 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 7. There is an underlying context that, that I've never heard touched on, that I've never heard preached. And there's one thing I want to say in the, you know, the preliminary portion of the sermon here. I want to give you a couple of things to watch out for, and these are statements that I've made with other sermons, when it may have been just one point that I was emphasizing. But this is going to be shown very clearly in this sermon. It's going to be a principle that you can carry with you, and this is going to be an ideal example of this. And that is how I've made the statement uh, so many times of comparing, number one, comparing Scripture with Scripture. Cross-referencing and comparing Scripture with Scripture is how you understand the Bible. That is how you will understand the Bible. If you never compare Scripture to Scripture, you will never know your Bible. I have no, you know, I make no bones about it. I am 100% positive you will never grow in a true understanding of your Bible. You will be lacking, I mean, in a major way if you do not compare Scripture with Scripture. Because God wrote the whole Bible. He wrote the entire Bible, and there are portions that complement other parts of the Bible. There are certain parts of the Bible that are meant to explain something. They're meant to be used to interpret something else. And they're meant to explain something that maybe is in a different book. Now, the second point that I want to, want to make, number one was cross-references. That is the most important. Tonight's sermon will be very much of a Bible study. Number one, cross-reference. Cross-reference. Look up words. Look up where they're used elsewhere in the Bible. Number one. Number two is this. I've often said that you will find your answer that you are looking for. If there's something confusing in the Bible, if there's something you can tell that you know that there's some more meat there, right? And you just want to understand something, but it just doesn't feel like you're able to get it right where you're at. Oftentimes, that other cross-reference will be in the same book that you are in. Not only will it be in the same book you are in, very often you will find it um, you know, frequently in a book that's authored by the same person of the book that you're reading at that time. There are certain revelations that are given to specific people that wrote down um, Scripture. Peter uh, you know, details this very specifically in 2 Peter. He talks about how there are uh, you know, uh, revelations that are given unto Paul. Paul even mentions that also. He says that there was given him a thorn in the flesh to buffet him, that he wouldn't be exalted above measure because of the abundance of of revelations, the abundance of wisdom that was given them. So there's specific wisdom, and you can tell in certain books that they have certain themes. And there are things in that book that you can't learn elsewhere, right? But I'm going to show you the importance of cross-referencing. I have some parallels that, uh, you know, that we're going to look at with 1 John chapter number 5 that is really, I believe, going to open this text up for you, and it's going to give you a greater understanding of what this is actually teaching. Now we're going to begin reading in verse number 1. Verse number one, the Bible reads, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. So he says, everyone that loveth or loves him that begat, talking about God, you are going to love him also that is begotten of him. Referring to other brothers and sisters in Christ, other children of God, right? That's why he says in verse two, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Verse 3, for this is the love of God. So this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. So the way to show God that you love him is by keeping his commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? Jesus is God, of course. Verse 4, it says, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory 
that overcometh the world, even our faith. Verse 5. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Now I want to make a quick comparison between three statements that were just made. And that is the statement in verse 5, verse 4, and verse 1. So we saw what we just read in verse 5. He says, who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So when you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Bible teaches that you are overcoming the world. Look at verse 4. He said, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Okay, so what that means is, at the moment that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you are born of God, and you, at that moment, overcome the world. You are enabled to be able to overcome the world. But Real interesting, if we compare verse 1 and verse 5, it says this in verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Now look again at verse 5. He said, who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So you notice what's used interchangeably there is Son of God and Christ. This happens all throughout the Bible. We're going to look at another example here in just a moment. But it happens all throughout the Bible. When Peter was asked, when Jesus, the Lord, asked him, you know, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? He goes on and explains, you know, some say Elias, some say John the Baptist, others, you know, some of the other prophets. And he says, whom do he say that I am? And he tells him, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Right? So he says, you're the Christ. And in the same breath, he says, you're the Son of God. Now, I want you to turn over to Luke chapter number 1, verse number 35. Luke chapter number 1, verse number 35. So we get a clear definition from the Bible. We want the Bible's definition. We don't want man's definition. You know, we don't want to go to, to some creed that was written and see what man believes about who the Son of God is. We want to say who the Bible says the Son of God is and why he is called the Son of God. The definition of the Son of God is given very, very clearly in Luke chapter number 1, verse number 35. The Bible reads... And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, so because God is going to cause Mary to conceive by the Holy Ghost, right? Because God is going to send his Holy Spirit and miraculously cause Mary to conceive in her womb. It says, Therefore, also, that holy thing which shall be born of thee, shall be called the Son of God. No, so consequently, because it's saying that the Holy Ghost is going to come upon her, that holy thing which shall be born. What is shall be? What tense is that? That's future tense. So at, at this point when he is speaking to Mary, has the Son of God been born yet? He has not been born yet, has he? Now, we know that the Bible teaches God was manifest in the flesh, right? right. So the person of the Son of God is from everlasting. He is Amen. eternal. He is the eternal God. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Right. But he was not yet the Son of God. You know why? Because that holy thing was not born yet. Right. Point blank. Shall be called the Son of God. That holy thing which shall be born. And people say, oh, well, that's, that's Jesus. No, yeah, but here's the point. He wasn't born as a man yet. That's the problem. Until he was born as a man, he's not the son of God. He's called the son of God because he had a birth. It's the definition of a son. I mean, we could just open a dictionary. If it wasn't for all this confusion about the Orthodox train in the first place, you would understand what it means to be a son, right? The God was born as a man. Therefore, after he had a birth, once he became a man, once he was someone's son, right? His father in heaven. Once he became the man, he was then the son of God. Correct? Now, who was the Christ? The Christ was a seed that was going to be born. You see the, the parallels between those two things. There was a promise that was given all the way back to Eve, that was given to Noah, that was given to Abraham, that was given to David, that ultimately there would be a seed that would come that would be the Messiah or that would be the Savior, and he was going to be born. Right? He was going to you know, be, be a man. You find out later in Scripture as you read on that that man or that Savior is going to be God himself. It is going to be Jehovah in the flesh. And the Christ is the same as the Son of God. The Christ is the promised one, and the promised one was God who came and was born as a man. That is the Son of God, and he is referred to as the Son of God because he came in the flesh. 
that's very important to understand. I'm laying a foundation right now because we're going to look at the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the subsequent verses of where we are right now. And this really you know, explains a lot. If you don't understand this, you're not going to understand the following verses. So keep that concept in mind. So he says right there, Who is he that overcame, overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? So that's the, that's the concept right now. Look over real quick, actually. Let's take a quick pause. Look at 1 John chapter number 4, verse number 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ, watch this, is come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. So what's the discussion? Whether the Messiah has come, right? And come what? In the flesh. See how that makes sense with the Son of God? See how that makes sense with the Christ? They believe who he's speaking of right now are Jews, right? They believe they're Antichrist because they believe in a Christ, but it's not Jesus. So they're, they're saying, you couldn't say, oh, the Christ hasn't come in the flesh if you didn't believe that there's a Christ in the first place. You know, only a person, that, you wouldn't argue with someone about that unless you believe that there's a Christ. You would, that's what actually anti-Christ actually means. And that's what he's discussing here, showing you that that context is spoken of I, um, prior to this too. That theme is spoken of before. Now look at verse 6. So we just read verse 5 where it discusses the person that believes that he's the son of God. Look at verse 6. This is he that came by water and blood. Now, what we just read over in 1 John chapter 4, what did it say? He's come in the flesh. What is water and blood? It's referring to the flesh, right? Go over to John chapter number 3. John chapter number 3 quickly. Now, we're going to be paralleling John chapter number, or John, the book of John, multiple chapters in the book of John, over and over and over again. Because like I said, it's very important. Cross-referencing is very important. We're going to see a lot of just direct parallels. All like, like some of the verbiage and some of the language will be literally word for word in like a five word phrase or five word sentence. John chapter number three, when Jesus is speaking unto Nicodemus towards the former part of the chapter, he says in verse number three, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again. So you, you have to be born a second time. Be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So if a man is just born once, right, if he's just born as a man, he's not going to go into heaven, right? He cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 4, Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be, and be born? So notice he relates this automatically to that which is carnal. He does not understand the spiritual, right? Uh, Nicodemus is an unsaved man is why. He says there, can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So Jesus answers him. This is in response to him thinking that he has to be born of the flesh twice, right? Jesus answers in verse 5, and he says, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, that's your first birth, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now watch, he's going to further explain to you the water and the Spirit. Now watch this. He says in verse 6, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. So comparing verses 5 and 6, you can clearly see that the water is being defined as the flesh birth, right? That's being defined as the first birth. And Jesus is saying you can't only have one birth and go into the kingdom of heaven, right? You can't only have one birth, he says, kingdom of God, here, but they're used interchangeable. You can't only have one birth and go into the kingdom of God. You have to be born of the water. You have to be born of the flesh and of the Spirit. So we can see in the book of John where Jesus actually calls a fleshly birth a birth of that which is of water. Does that make sense, everyone? Also, I believe in John chapter number 1, I could be incorrect about this, maybe somebody else remembers this, but when he's talking about, you know, that we're born of God and we're born of the Spirit, he says, you know, we're, we're not born of blood. I believe he makes that statement. So there's another reference of being born of blood, referring to being born of flesh, and then being born of water, as we see here, being born of flesh. In the context of 1 John 5, his whole point is that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. God, he is the Son of God. God has come as a man. He's been born, right? The Messiah has come. He's had a birth, okay? So he said, when he says in verse 6, this is he that came by water and blood. And he says, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, 
but by water and blood. And then he says this, and it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is truth. Now, I want you to notice that there. What is, what is the spirit bearing witness of? Now, this is where people start to break down right here. This is where it gets very important. I want you to follow along. What is the spirit bearing witness of? His birth, exactly. Well, it would be the fact that he's a man, right? He came in the flesh, right? Let's say that. It's that he's the son of God, right? It's that he's a man, right? Of course, that's what it's speaking of. It's saying that he came by water and blood. So he was here, right? He came by water and blood. And the spirit, it says, bears witness or bears record of that, right? And, and notice that phrase. It said, because the spirit is truth. It specifically uses the word that the Spirit bears witness. But we'll see, we're going to see these used interchangeably. Bearing witness, testifying, and bearing record. These are all used interchangeably. Look at verse number 7. It says, for, <clears throat> excuse me, there are three that bear record. Now, what are we talking about right now? What are we talking about? Let's repeat it one more time. He's coming in the flesh. He's coming in the flesh, right? So we're still on the same subject. So what the three are bearing record of is that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He came by water and blood, right? So there are three. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Now, people will mock this idea, you know, when we will teach. And I'm going to hit on this a little bit later. When, when, you know, I teach that the word means like the spoken word of God, right? But I just read the Bible for what it says. I don't use man's definition. Every other time the Bible uses the word, the, the term word, it means a spoken word. It just means word. Okay, so when I read this, I just believe the Bible for what it says. The, you know, the term word is used multiple times in the book of 1 John, and they would say, oh yeah, that means word. Same word in the English, same word in the Greek, there's no difference. But all of a sudden, they have a special revelation here, and this is the title or the name of a person in heaven. And this is what they say. This is the point that I'm going to kind of catalyst into right now for a moment. This is what they say, that the word here is the second person of the Trinity, which is who? Jesus, the Son of God, right? What, what I want to draw your attention to is what are the three in heaven bearing record of? They're bearing record of the Son of God, right? So you have the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and they're bearing record that the Son of God is come in the flesh. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? That's what they're actually bearing record of right now. So that's actually what this is teaching, number one. And I, I, we're going to come back to something in just a moment, but I want to move on to verse, to, to verse 8 now. So it says, And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood, <clears throat> And these three agree in one. So notice that, <clears throat> Michaela, get, give me a drink, please. Um, so notice that, get a water. So notice that um, in verse number eight, this is, this, there's the repetition here, right? It's, it, you know, he, make, he, he, makes, he uses the same language except of speaking of that which is in heaven, which is always a, a, you know, a, a term to the Lord, right? He speaks of something that that, is, of that which is in earth. So in Verse number 7, he says, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now, this is the strongest verse on the Trinity in the Bible, and I say amen. amen. I believe in the Trinity. Right. I reject the Orthodox Trinity. Amen. I reject that there are three persons in heaven bearing record. And if you ask someone, hey, take me to a Bible verse, prove to me, I believe the Bible. Show me a verse in the Bible where God is three persons. And they're like, right here, real happy and excited. 1 John 5, 7. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Case closed. And they're like, they're bearing record. It has to be. They're persons. Because you tell them, where's the word persons? And they're like, okay, it doesn't say persons. But, hear me out, all right? If they're bearing record, they have to be persons. Huh? Look at verse 8. Look at verse 8. And there are three that bear witness in earth, in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. Okay? Is blood a person? No. Is water a person? No. No. Right. And then the spirit, well, you could say that's the Holy Spirit. That's a person. 
So it's only, this is really like, actually, that like proves my point. You know what I mean? That's one person in that, in that verse right there, right? So notice how that falls apart when you read it in context. And, and here's the thing. People talk, oh, they're bearing record. They have to be a person. I can show you a passage in the Old Testament where a rock bears record. Amen. Where a, bo- a rock bears witness. I, I even, I'll even show you something perfect because I believe that's a spoken word that's bearing record and that's bearing witness right there. Do you know what you have in Revelation chapter number 14 when all the saints are raptured in the second account that's spoken of? Uh, the second record of the, uh, of the end times prophecy. They're all in heaven and they begin to sing what? Song. The song of Moses. And do you know what he says that that song of Moses is? You know what? He, when you look at it in the Old Testament and the New Testament, you compare it and you actually look up the song of Moses. He said that this song is a testimony against you. What is the song? It's words that you write down and you can read them out of a hymnal and it's testifying against you. And you know what that, that is? It's actual words. Like a spoken word that you would speak out of your mouth and it's bearing record against somebody. Right. It's bearing record. It's bearing testimony, right? It's bearing witness, right? Now, I'm going to prove without a shadow of a doubt within context that that is the literal word. But I want to show you something real quick about what this is speaking of. So, notice there when it says the spirit is truth at the end of verse 6. He tells you four. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and then he says, and these three are one. After he says that the Spirit is truth, right? He says, these three are one. Turn over to John chapter number 4, verse number 24. John chapter number 4, verse number 24. <clears throat> <clears throat> John chapter number 4, verse number 24, the Bible reads, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So do you notice that what the Bible actually says the nature of God is? It says God is a spirit. You say, oh, let's talk about the Holy Spirit. Look at the verse before it. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. So who is it talking about when it says God? The Father, right? So that destroys this system of where these people try to say, well, you have the Holy Spirit, right? You have the Father. You have the, you know, the Son of God. You have these three distinct. They all have, you know, they're all separate. They're, you know, they're not alike. Well, they all have, if you were to say, one essence, one nature, because they are spirit. They have one spirit. We can use that language you know, there's nothing wrong with saying they're of the same nature, right? They're of the same essence. It's not biblical, but they're not three distinct persons. You know why? Because it's the spoken word of God that is spirit. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The Father is talked of as being God is a spirit. Go back to 1 John chapter number 5 and look at actually that is what it's explaining here. It's saying that the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, their spirit is Therefore, their record is true. That's actually what this is teaching. Look at the end of verse number 6 again. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness because the Spirit is truth. Now it's going to validate, it's going to show you how you can know for sure that the record in heaven is true because we know that the Spirit is truth, right? God's Spirit. We know that the Father is Spirit. We just read that. We know that, that the words are Spirit because Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are Spirit and they are life. And, of course, we know that the Holy Ghost is spirit. So he says, for there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. They're one what? They're one spirit. That right there is the record of God. That's God bearing record in heaven. Now, when we look at verse number 8, then it says this. And there are three that bear witness in earth. The spirit and the water and the blood, and then he says this, and these three agree in one. Now, what do we establish that the water and the blood was a reference to just a moment ago? Humanity, right? Flesh, right? And then what is the spirit there that's spoken of again? It's, a, it's, it's the spirit of God, right? <clears throat> exactly. Okay? I want you to look at verse number 9. If we receive the witness of men, then it says this, the witness of God is greater. Okay. Verse number seven, what you have spoken of here, 
is the record or the witness of God. When you get down to verse number 8, we have, when it's speaking of the water and the blood, we have the record or the witness of men. Now I want you to keep your hand here, and I want you to go over, I'm going to have you turn to John, go to John chapter number, let's go to John chapter 5. Actually, go to John 19. Go to John 19 first. John 19, while we're talking about the spirit and the water and the blood, what? And it says that they agree in one, right? The spirit and the water and the blood. I'm sorry, John, that was incorrect. Go to John 15. The end of John chapter number 15, look at verse number 26. John chapter number 15, verse number 26 says this, but when the comforter has come, who's the comforter? The Holy Spirit. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you. Now, in context, why is it called the Comforter? It's called the Comforter because he's coming to you specifically to, com to, to comfort you. He's going to be dwelling inside of you, right? But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father. Now, watch this. Even the Spirit of truth. Now, does that sound familiar? It's the exact language that was used in 1 John chapter 5. It says, which proceedeth from the Father, look at this, he shall testify of me. Now notice this is not a disembodied testimony. How is he going to test testify? He's going to be sent unto them, right? So it's going to be indwelling them. He's saying the comforter, who I'm going to send unto you, he will testify. How is he going to testify? Through them. Do you understand? Watch this. Look at the next verse. Verse 27. And ye also shall bear witness. There's your water and your blood. Notice both of them are spoken of as bearing witness. Both of them are spoken of as, being, as testifying, right? It's referring to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of them while they preach the Word of God. But notice it makes a distinction between their testifying. Not to say that, oh, you know, the Spirit speaks sometimes in the Word and then the flesh speaks sometimes. It's, it's not, you know, it doesn't work in that type of manner. But he just makes the distinction because the Holy Spirit will be indwelling them, right? And the Holy Spirit will be speaking through them and testifying through them, right? And many of the apostles that are standing here are also going to pin down Scripture. Will they or will they not, right? John, who wrote this book, wrote down this actual uh, statement that was told him. So you can see how both are testifying. And it says even in that passage, the Spirit of truth, it says, He will testify of me. And he's going to be testifying through man, right, on the earth. That's the spirit of truth, okay? Go back again to uh, 1 John chapter number 5. So in verse number 8, when he says, And there are three that bear witness in earth. What are they bearing witness of? Uh, well, I'm sorry? Exactly. Yeah, well, it would be the fact that he's water and blood, right? That's what, we're, that's what they're bearing record, that he came in the flesh, that he's a man, right? They're bearing record that he is a man, that he's flesh, that he's water and blood. And it's saying here that there is, you know, water and blood and the spirit that's bearing record. We compare that unto John chapter number uh, 16, where we were just at. And we look at the end part of that chapter and he says that there are these men, these fleshly men, right? His apostles, they are going to bear record in tandem with the spirit. The spirit, it says, and the water and the blood and these three agree in one. And then verse 9 he tells you, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. So he summarizes for you, verse 7 was what? The witness of God. And then actually in verse 8, a fuller understanding is you have the witness of men of water and blood, right? But then you also have the Holy Spirit testifying through them. Does everyone understand? Everyone follow so far? Okay, keep your hand here. I want you to turn to another passage in the book of John. <clears throat> And I want you to go to John chapter number 19. It's very interesting. John chapter number 19. John chapter number 19. <clears throat> Again, I think I was... No, I was right. John chapter number 19. We're going to look at verse number 32. So that was actually referring to, and I'm going to show this to you, a specific event of the water and the blood. Now look at John... Chapter number 19, look at verse number 32. The Bible says this, Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first, and of the other which was crucified with him. 
Verse 33. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side. Now watch this. And forthwith came there out blood and water. Now notice that. What did it mention in 1 John chapter number 5? That he came by water and blood, right? Notice what it said there. It said that at this moment there came out water and blood. Do you know what that proved? That he was a real man. That he came in the flesh. This is a real man. It was a real death that occurred, right? Forthwith came there out blood and water. But I want you to look at verse number 35. And he that saw it bear record. Watch further. And his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true. So notice it's stressing. This is true. This is true. And it says, and he knoweth that he saith true, that he might believe. Now, who do we know is the only person that bears record, and it's true? The spirit of truth, right? The Bible says the spirit of truth in 1 John chapter number 5, at the end of verse number 6, it tells you, well, I'll just read verse number 6 to you again. You can stay where you are because we're going to look at something else there. It says, this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is true. So what's bearing record when he dies on the cross? The Spirit is bearing record. God is bearing record. These three are bearing record. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost are all bearing record, it tells you in the following verse, of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that He came by water and blood. So that's the Spirit that's bearing record, right? Well, I want you to turn over one chapter. Now, I've, I've heard a lot of people say that, I've heard this multiple times, that the person that's bearing record was the soldier. Has anyone else ever heard that? I've heard that, Brother Elliot, you've heard that? I've heard that from probably three people at least, different people preaching this. That it's the soldier. I'm going to show you that that's not who it was. Number one, we know it. We know that it's the Holy Spirit. It's the spirit of truth that, that bore record of this. It tells you that in 1 John 5, 6. But if you flip over to John chapter number 20, verse number 30, it says this. And many other signs... Truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Now look at verse number 31. It says, but these are written. Now notice, what are written? What's, what's something that you write down? Words, right? He says, these things are written that you might believe, watch this, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life. Through his name. Now, so when we flip over one page, we see in John chapter number 20, verse number 30 and 31, it says he did a lot of things, but the things that are written in this book specifically, everything that is written in this book specifically is written so that you would believe that he's the Son of God. Do you know what you have to know? You have to know that he came by water and blood to believe that he is the Son of God. That he came by flesh. You have to know that he truly came by water and blood. And the things in this... Are, the things that are written in this are written so that you might believe that he's the Christ. Notice again, here's that, that pattern of repetition of Christ meaning Son of God. That you might believe, it says, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Flip over again, John chapter number 21, one more page. <clears throat> it says in verse number 24, <clears throat> watch this. This is the disciple which testifieth of these things. Now notice that phrase. This is the disciple that testified of these things. So who actually was that referring to in John chapter number 19? John. It would be speaking of John. But time out. What does 1 John chapter number 5, 8 say? It says that there are three that bear witness in earth. Of what? Of the water. That Jesus Christ came by water and blood. There are three that bear witness on earth. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of truth, which is why in John chapter number 19, when John's writing, he says that he saw it, and he says, you know it, that he saith true. Is he speaking of himself? No, because the witness of man isn't that great, is it? He's speaking of the witness of God. Because what is the witness of God? The Spirit of truth, right? Now here... What you have in verse number 24 is John actually telling you that this was him that saw that, that this was him that testified of that. He says, this is the disciple which testified of these things, 
look at this, and wrote these things. And it says, and we know that his testimony is true. How do we know that his testimony is true? What's the only way that you can know that it's true? If it's just the witness of men, can we know that it's true? No, it has to be that the Holy Spirit was bearing record. And that's why it says agreeing. They don't have conflicting testimonies, right? John sees it, the water and the blood. He sees it with his own eyes. But he's filled with the Holy Spirit. You know what he does? The Holy Spirit dwells inside of him. And God inspires the book of John and he writes it down. The Holy Spirit dwelling inside of him. And he says repeatedly, notice in John chapter number 21, he speaks over and over and over again about how, what's the witness? What is he saying in the witnesses and what's testifying? He says over and over again that the things that are written, these things are written so that you might believe. He says, this is the record, right? Over and over again, he refers to the word, right? In 1 John chapter number 5, or five, yeah, 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 9, it says, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. And then it says, for this is the witness which he hath testified of his son. Now, very interesting. I want you to look in, in, in the book of John again, if you're still there. Now I want you to go over to John chapter number 5, verse number 31. John chapter number 5, verse number 31, an even further parallel. John 5, verse number 31 so Jesus Christ came by water and blood. So what does that mean? He's a man, right? He's in the flesh. Jesus was a real man. A lot of people have trouble understanding that. He was fully God and was born and was fully man. 100% fully God and fully man. <clears throat> you have, beginning there, John chapter number 5, verse number 31, Jesus speaking, and he says, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Look at verse number 32. There is another that beareth witness of me. Watch what he says. Keep, keep paying close attention here. And I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Now, what is the true witness? The Spirit, right? He says in verse 33, Ye sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. Now watch. But I receive not testimony from man. But these things I say that ye might be saved. He, referring to John, was a burning and a shining light, and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his life. Now, verse 36. This will sound very familiar. But I have greater witness than that of John. What was his, his witness? It was the true witness, the witness of the Spirit. What did 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 9 say? If we receive the witness of men, be like John's witness, right? It says the witness of God is great. Right? He's saying, I have a greater witness than that of John. Because why? He has the Holy Spirit witnessing on his behalf. He has God witnessing on his behalf. Who's bearing record? The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Now, these Trinitarians have a real big problem when they want to try to say that that second person, the Word there, is bearing record of, uh, you know, of the Son of God in context. That's what they overlook is that he's actually, the Word is bearing record of who they refer to as the second person. And they don't believe that he's omnipresent. Right. So you have a serious issue when you say, no, the second person is not omnipresent. You know, who the Lord Jesus Christ is, he became a man and he's not in heaven anymore. Well, explain to me why it says the Son of Man which is in heaven. Right. Number one. Number two, why does Jesus say when he dies on the cross, today shalt thou be with me in paradise? Explain that to me. Right? right? My position makes perfect sense because I believe that the one and only true God is in heaven, seated upon the throne. He never left heaven. He came down to heaven through his word. His word was born on this earth. But here's the thing. He didn't lose his word. He's not like stuck without his word. He can't speak while he's in heaven or on earth, right? He still remains 100% fully God in heaven. But guess what? He's fully God on earth as well, and he's fully man all at the same time. You say, man, that's a mystery. That's hard to understand. Great is the mystery of godliness. The, you know, the fact that there's three persons is not a mystery. The Bible never calls that, you know, it never says that's a mystery. The mystery is trying to wrap your brain around how the infinite God became finite. How the God who knows everything grew in wisdom. Right. How the God who owns the world and created man, he grew as a man. He grew in stature. Yeah. That's the mystery. He's trying to understand that. You know what you have? You have the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost bearing record of the Son of God on earth. Notice it's the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost that are bearing record. John says... That it was the spirit that bare record. You know how you know I you know how that it's true for sure? 
You know how I, you can know that it's true? Because it's the Spirit that's bearing record. You can believe that he's saying true. You think he's talking about himself? No. There's, there's three that bear record also. And on the earth as well. Right? The Spirit indwelling man, testifying, like it says in John chapter number 16, within man. There isn't a stitch of prophecy that you have ever heard that any man has ever heard that didn't come from them from a man. Besides the few exceptions of prophets that God spoke directly to him. Think about that for a minute. Every, every word in this book was pinned down by a man. Testifying. You understand what I'm saying? Every single word in this book was pinned down by a man. God spoke the word, spent the word, and they wrote the words down. All the apostles and prophets, all the things that they seen, you had to believe that man's testimony. But guess what? You weren't only just receiving a man's testimony because they had the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of them. And they would go forth and they would preach this. And you could know that what they said was true. Yeah, you could know what John preached in John, cha in, in John chapter number 19 was true. Not because, you know, he's just a reliable guy. No, because he had the faithful and true witness dwelling inside of him. Because he had the Spirit of God and the Spirit is truth. We have the witness, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost in heaven witnessing, right? Of the Son of God on earth. Showing a distinction between the Word in heaven and the Son of God. So it's not, you know, oh, you know, that's the Son. No, no, no. It's the Word, His spoken Word. You say, I don't believe that. Look at John 5. I'm going to prove it to you that a shadow of doubt. So it says in uh, verse number 36, But I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do. Bear witness of me. Watch that, that the Father hath sent me. So who's bearing witness right here? <clears throat> be the Father, right? He says, And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. So right here we have the Father bear, bearing witness. You see a lot of parallels, right? Everybody can see the clear parallels between the witness of man, the witness of God is greater. You have the Spirit, you have the, uh, God witnessing on his behalf. You have Father witnessing on his behalf. I want you to keep reading. Watch what it says next. Verse 37, The Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. Watch this, verse 38. And ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. Look at verse 39. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. That is the scriptures. That is a literal word that's sitting down. And guess what they're testifying of? The Son of God. Amen. The, the man Christ Jesus that was born. You have a literal man walking on the earth, a physical, fully man. And he's fully God. And he says, the word testifies of me. Amen. The scriptures testify of me. Roger Jimenez, that stinking spineless coward, wants to stand up and say, oh, Tyler Baker believes he's got a Bible sitting down next to him in heaven. You know, the Father's got a Bible that's sitting down. Take it up with Jesus. Search the scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they, they are which they testify of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. They testify of Jesus Christ. He is such a stinking cow. He wants to call me out like three or four times. I was just going to let it slide. That guy wants to stand up and act like he's this stinking tough guy. Like five foot. You're like 4'11". He's the size of my mom. Get out of here. He stands up on the pulpit when he gets a faithful word. And he wants to try to act like he's ripping face like this. Ripping, you know, stand up on the pulpit. The guy, it's, it's, it's so embarrassing because you know what he did? He stood up and he's like, you want to say that you believe like me, huh? You want to say you believe like me, Victor Tay? He's like, I say I believe there's three persons. Stand up behind that, cow, uh, behind that pulpit and say you believe they're one person too, you stinking coward. You think right. you would have done that? Right. You're not right. a tough guy. That's right. You would have never stood up behind that pulpit in front of, sea of people, all the sea of people of faithful word and said, hey, I believe there's one person. You would have never done that, you stinking spineless coward. Right. So I, this guy's ridiculous. I would get behind that pulpit and I would preach exactly what I believe and I wouldn't be scared at all. Amen. And that guy wants to act like he's a tough guy or something. Like he's calling people out. He is a coward. He folded under the pressure and he's not a pastor. He has his own pastor. That's right. The guy is weak. And I, and I called him, I said he's weak as water. And this guy commented on one of my videos and was like, you saw it? He's like... He said he's weak as water. Water is the strongest uh, uh, force in nature. 
<laughs> Weak as water is a phrase from the Bible, you moron. Right. It's in the book of Ezekiel twice, you idiot. Yeah, maybe you need to search the scriptures, buddy. Yeah. Read the Bible. You know, it's funny when I speak, I speak scriptures. And then these people, when you when when you when you when you quote the Bible to them, you're like, hey, the man Christ Jesus. They're like, what are you, an Aryan? That's Bible! That's the Bible, buddy! You're not able to understand it because you don't read the scriptures. Right. You know what testifies of Jesus? The Word. Amen. You know what John said when he pinned it down and he wrote it? He said, these things are written. These things are written. These things bear record so that you might know that Jesus is the Christ. Amen. You know what that testimony is when it talks about there in, in 1 John chapter number 5? The testimony that he came by water and blood. It's John chapter number 19 that was spoken from the lips of God. The word, the literal spoken word. John, God spoke, spake those words through the Holy Spirit, through John, and these three agree in one. Amen. He told him in John chapter number 16, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, right? He said, he's going to testify of me. And he says, I'm going to send him unto you, and he's going to testify of me. The Spirit didn't just go around and just preach to people, you know, just like a flying spirit around. No, it was inside of man. He said, I'm going to send the Comforter. Speaking of, he's going to be dwelling inside of you, comforting you. And you're going to preach to the Holy Spirit. And he says, and ye also will testify. Like two different testimonies? No, they agree in one. Amen. That was John that was looking. And John saw the water and the blood being filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was, you know, the Spirit was in his body. While he had blood pumping in his body, he had the Holy Spirit also in his body. And when he sat down and he wrote those scriptures down, those scriptures, they, they, were, they bore record of the Son of God. When they wrote about the water and the blood coming out of the Lord Jesus Christ's eye. And notice the word is bearing record of the Son of God. Notice the distinction. Yeah. The word in heaven, right? The word in, 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 even at that time, the word in heaven is bearing record. Because the word is with God constantly. Amen. God's a trinity, but he's not three persons with three different minds, three different wills, three different bodies, three different centers of consciousness. That polytheism. Right. It's more than one God. Right. And yeah, these three people, you know, walking around, you know, just doing whatever they want to do. It's just a bizarre thought. It's yeah. super weird. Amen. Like, I'm hungry. What do you want to do? You know? <laughs> where, do you, where do you want to go? I want to go to McDonald's. I want to go to Burger King. It's super odd. Right. It's very strange, you know? When you have, like, they, they have their own just, like, cognitive ability, thinking. And what if one guy just decides to do something different than the other guy? Yeah. You know, they, they say it's just a weird, it's a weird, strange thought. It's not biblical. Right. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, this is the, the Trinity of God, and it is God Himself, the Father, it is His Word, His spoken Word, and it is His Holy Spirit. And these three are one, they're the Spirit of truth, because God is a Spirit. His words are Spirit. It says in verse 39, one more time, search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. He keeps speaking about this topic. If you look at verse 40, and you will not come to me that you might have life. Skip down verse 45. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom you trust. For had ye, look at this, referring to the scriptures again. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me, but if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? Go back to 1 John chapter number 5. 1 John chapter number 5. <clears throat> Now I want you to notice what it says right after this. Verse 9, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. He's comforting them that the witness that you received was not only just the witness of man. He's explaining to you that the witness that you received was the Holy Spirit testifying within man. The water, the blood, and the Spirit, and these three agree in one. They agreed in John, right? The apostles, when they were sent forth, he said, you're going to testify of me with the Holy Spirit testifying, agreeing in one. Further proof of that, look at the very next verse, verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. What's that speaking of? Amen. The Holy Spirit right. hath the witness in himself. That same witness, that one witness, that one God is witnessing in himself. He that believeth not God, I'm sorry, he that believeth not God hath made him a liar. Watch this, because he believeth not the record. Now watch, watch again, that God gave of his Son. So he, he, he uh, summarizes the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit as God from 1 John 5, 7. And he said, God gave this record of his Son. Does everybody understand that? That's
that same God was obviously the fullness of the God that was dwelling in the Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus said, because he humbled himself, he lived as a man. He humbled himself. He said in John chapter 5, when we read just a moment ago, I don't bear witness of myself, right? But, of course, simultaneously, he did bear witness of himself in heaven, right? Great is the mystery of God. Because he is that one and only true God. That's why he says elsewhere that he does bear witness of himself. Because he bears witness of himself in heaven. Because he was that one and only true God seated in heaven. He said, the Son of Man, which is in heaven. That's why Jesus Christ says, you know, the Bible will teach that the Father raised him from the dead. Right? But then what does Jesus say? Jesus says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Because he was that one and only true God in heaven that raised himself from the dead. Amen. Right? Look at 1 John chapter 5 further. It says in verse 11, watch this closely. So let's read verse 10 again in context and then we'll read verse 11. I want you to notice this. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. Look at verse 11. And this, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life and this life is in his Son. What's the record? And this is the record. Amen. This is the record. 1 John 5, 7, there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. It's not a Bible sitting next to him. It's the spoken eternal Word of God that dwells inside of his bosom and that he speaks out of his mouth. The promise was before the foundation of the world. God's words are spirit, and God is a spirit. Therefore, his words eternally just dwell with him. It's an amazing concept. You know, it's obviously hard for us to understand, but the Bible says Jesus' words were not normal words. He said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. You look at John chapter 1, verse number 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So God's Word was dwelling with him. He says, he's not talking about his Word. It says, all things were made by him, and without him there was not nothing made that was made. So let's use that. You go back to Genesis chapter number 1 and how were things made. Let there be light. Amen. Scripture with Scripture. Cross-referencing. John, you know who wrote the first John? This is the first epistle, the general epistle of John. You know who wrote the book of John? Same author. See a lot of these same things? You compare Scripture with Scripture. It's the key to understanding your Bible. See a lot of the same phrases? Bearing record, witness, the spirit of truth, water and blood. You have to compare Scripture with Scripture. And even more so, moreover, you have to compare. But very often you'll find your answer in the very book that you're writing, that you're reading. Or you will find your answer in, in oftentimes in a book, frequently, that is written by that same author. Another book. So he says in verse 11, And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. This is the record. What he's writing down, these words. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. You say, I don't believe this is the record. Look at verse, verse uh, 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Watch what he says. That ye may know that ye have eternal life. Why? Because it's the spirit of truth. That's what he's saying. Amen. These words are not normal words. This spirit that's written down here is the spirit of God. It's not just the witness of man. It's the witness of God. And the witness of God is greater. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. What do you see John say at the end of the Gospel of John? These things are written that you might believe that he's the Son of God. 1 John chapter number 5 tells you, being the Son of God is you have to understand that, that, that he was water and blood. And what does John make sure that he includes in John chapter number 19? Forthwith came there out water and blood. These things are written. That you might believe that he's the Christ, the Son of God. What was it? What was it? The book of John, the, the gospel of John is the record that God gave of his son. Amen. First John is the record that God gave of his son. Oh, the Son of God. Right. I mean, this is an amazing book. Amen. Amen. I need to cherish this book. This is not a normal book. Amen. I mean, can't you see that this is not? I mean, when I just read this book. You know, his, his spirit bears witness with my spirit. And I, I see the cross references. I see that no man could sit down and say, I'm going to add a little cool nugget here. No man could do this. Right. No man could put together a book like this. You could take 
the hundred of the greatest scholars that's ever lived from the beginning of the foundation of the world, put them in a room and give them 2,000 years they couldn't write a book like this. Right. It's right. the most amazing book that has ever been written, will ever be written. And you know what's greater than that is this, that the Word was made flesh, and we get to heaven, we're going to be able to stand before and, and shake the hand and hug and see the Word of God in the flesh. Amen. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Amen. Amen. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You know, if you could pound into somebody's head, that's talking about like the words of God, maybe you'll cherish this book more. Yeah. Maybe you'll love this book more. Maybe you'll hold this. You know why that record's so important? Because it's the word of God. He's trying to convince you, hey, this is not normal words. This is spirit of truth. Yeah. These things are written. He's saying, I just explained to you that the spirit is truth. Right? Now you understand that it's the, that it's the spirit of truth and, and, and you know, implying to them, I'm writing by the Holy Spirit. And he said, these things have I written unto you. After he convinced them that he might know that he had eternal life. Now you can know because this is the spirit of truth. Amen. There is no error. Right. This is the spirit of truth. There's no error. There's no mistake. John wasn't writing. John didn't write with his pen. He's like, oh, man, I messed up this manuscript. Give me another one. Right? It was perfect the first time he wrote it down. Right? You know what it was? It was the spirit, the water, and the blood bearing record of what he saw. It was him sending the comforter to bear record, to bear witness. I'm going to send the spirit of truth, and he's going to testify of me. I'm going to send him unto you, and he's going to testify of me, and ye also shall bear witness. The spirit, the water, and the blood in man. Man is bearing record of, with the Holy Spirit dwelling him of that, that, that Jesus was the Christ, that he was the Son of God, that he came in the flesh, and then he died on the cross, and John saw water and blood come out of his side. And you have the record. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. We'll end here. Just because of the importance of it being a Bible study and all of that, I want you to turn over to <clears throat> Revelation chapter number 21. I want you to notice here, <clears throat> Revelation chapter number 21, verse number 5, it says, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Notice it's a faithful witness. Jesus is called the true and faithful witness. So the faithful and true witness in Revelation chapter 1. And then here we see the words being spoken by the Father that are bearing record. And he says, Write these words down. They're going to bear record because these are faithful and true words, right? Revelation chapter number 22, we can see the same thing in verse number 6. And he said unto me, these sayings, these are literal words, these sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. You know who penned down the book of Revelation also? John. John. You know, he's also, he also refers to you know, Jesus Christ, when he comes back on the white horse as the Word, and he says he's a faithful and true witness. So you see all these parallels. Him being called the Word in John 1. Him being called the Word, and we didn't look at it, but 1 John 1, but then also where we did look, 1 John 5. He's the Word in, in uh, Revelation 19 when he comes back on the white horse. So you see the importance of cross-referencing the books that, you, that are written by the same authors, right? You can see that there are certain truths that are learned from those certain books because specific truths were revealed unto specific apostles, as John says. So the importance of cross-referencing, number one, but also there are certain places where, where the same topics, topics are spoken of, like the Gospels. You need the synoptic Gospels especially, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke which tell almost the same story from beginning to end, just from a slightly different perspective. You need to take all of those, all, all, all three of those Gospels and compare the passages that are contained in each one, and you'll find truths that are not... You know, you'll find a little detail that's in one Gospel that may not be in the other two, right? And then you need to take books, maybe, the, you know, for another example, real quickly in closing... In the book of in, uh, Colossians, like we saw just uh, on Sunday morning, in Colossians, I believe it's chapter number 5, you compare that on Colossians chapter 3, I'm 
sorry. You compare that on to Ephesians chapter number 5. You can see the parallel of when he's talking about singing yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. If you compare that, I mean, you see there's slight differences. And you learn a little bit more by comparing those two things. Compare the books that are written by the Apostle John. Compare all of his books together. Especially when you notice, hey, there's a theme in both of these that are very similar. Compare them. Study your Bibles. Read your Bibles. Love your Bibles. You know, spend time in your Bible. Don't just read it just, just to just, hey, i got to get this over with. i got a certain amount of reading i got to get done. Read what you got to read. You know, but, but you need to love your Bible. You need to want to study it and learn from it. You know, like the psalmist said, he said, Thy word is very sweet, therefore thy servant loveth it. You know, we should love the Bible. Amen. We should love God's word because it's sweet, it's precious. You know, it's the most amazing thing on this planet. See, most, it's the greatest thing that we'll ever have tangible access to on this, on this planet. It's the closest that you'll ever get to God is by this word right here. Amen. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And the word was God. Love your Bibles. Let's pray and have a, let's end and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, dear Lord, for the word of God. I ask you that you would be with us, dear Heavenly Father. Um, I ask you that you would bless us all and uh, bless the time when my parents are here, dear Lord. I ask you that you would bless everyone in our church and just help us to love our Bibles and to learn them more. Uh, and we ask you that you would reveal things unto us, uh, help us to be humble. Dear Lord God, when you teach us things, and just as, as Jacob said, uh, we're not worthy of all the mercies and of all the truths and that thou hast shown in thy servant. Just help us to be humble. Help us to continually just study and learn your Bible. And please never, uh, never get to the point, allow us or help us to never get to the point where you will no longer teach us something from the word of God. Help us to be humble, dear Lord God. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen.